Greetings Biovores and welcome to Codex Compliant. Today we're going to be taking a look at the 1995 version of Codex Tyranids. A vast alien intellect has risen from the void of intergalactic space. The single monstrous entity which is the Tyranid race has found a new, rich feeding ground. The Human Galaxy. Being from 2nd edition, this was the first Tyranid Codex and was written by Andy Chambers. Also, a quick shout out to Phil and Keith who owned this copy before us. If you look very carefully under this little bit that's scribbled out, you can read, This is Keith Nash's, so don't steal it. I'm sorry, Keith. But it's ours now. The Tyranids were introduced to 40k in the first edition rulebook, where they were a pretty standard alien race. There was just one stat line for them, so it meant that what you'd call a termagant today was really just, well, a Tyranid. Gene Stealers existed as well, but they were an entirely unrelated Xeno race from the planet of Yimgarl. By the time of this codex, however, they'd gone through a few changes with the releases of things like Advanced Space Crusade and Tyranid Attack fleshing them out, meaning that the Tyranids of this book are broadly the same as the Tyranids of the current game, being an extragalactic alien race that are connected by a hive mind and seek to devour all of our delicious, delicious biomass. They were just a bit more colourful because, you know, second edition. Okay, so we're going to go through the fluff that's in this book, and first we're going to go through the intro text. Now, it's pretty long, but it is worth hearing. Beyond the human galaxy, beyond the range of human spacecraft and astral telepathy, lies the unspeakable cold of the intergalactic void. Few men have ventured into this realm, and none have ever returned. It is the great barrier that divides galaxy from galaxy. A place where time and space conspire to hold the galaxies apart with inconceivable distances. Yet the void is no longer empty. An immeasurably ancient and implacable intelligence moves through the cold and the darkness, its many eyes fixed on the distant glittering lights of our galaxy. The great devourer moves between the stars and hungers for the flesh of all who lie before it. This great organism, this monstrous entity, men know as a Tyranid race. Even by naming the Great Devourer, men betray their ignorance. Every thought and action, every spark of life in the Tyranid race is bound and interlinked into a single mind, into a single great entity which stretches over light years of space and is controlled by the immortal hive mind. A billion times a billion Tyranids stand at the rim of the galaxy, yet each one is no more than a single cell in the living body of the hive mind, the devourer of worlds. And that's just a great introduction. There's a cosmic horror vibe to it that really helps cement the appropriate level of dread to the oncoming Tyranid invasion. It then got to the first contact with the Tyranid race, where they wiped out an Imperial base on Tyran, a planet on the edge of the galaxy. This not only let the Imperium know they were coming, but also gave them a name. It then followed what would become known as High Fleet Behemoth as it descended upon Macrag, the home planet of the Ultramarines, and would go on to document the ultimate defeat of Behemoth at their hands, nicely borrowing from some lore introduced for the Ultras all the way back in the early days of First Edition. Similarly, they also explicitly draw attention to the fact that Gene Stealers had been around for a while, and the Imperium merely thought they were an unrelated alien. A theory later disproved with genetic testing and the small fact that Gene Stealers were fighting alongside the Tyranids. This meant that the information that we read about them back in the Road Trader rulebook was less retconned and more just outdated Imperial info. And I don't know, that's just a nice touch. There's then a segment on High Fleet Kraken, an invasion this time heralded by a Gene Stealer cult rebellion on the world of Icar 4. Once again, the Ultramarines were responsible for stamping this out, but that didn't stop Kraken from having a little old nibble on the Imperium, with hundreds of inhabited worlds falling and resulting in the near destruction of two Space Marine chapters, one of which being the Lamenters, because it's... it's always the Lamenters. Somebody please check on them, I'm very concerned. There's a fair amount of fiction to read in here too, some with people dealing with Tyranids proper, and some dealing with Gene Stealer cults. None are from the Tyranid perspectives, as you probably would imagine, it's a little hard to get into the head of an alien hive mind after all. The majority of it is based around the story of the Katachan jungle fighters defending themselves from Tyranids on Viridian Prime. This is notable for a couple of reasons. One is that the story starts off as just the 1987 film Predator, but with a lictor. 
I mean, it even paraphrases a line from the movie. Another is that it contains a character called Sly Manvers, which was obviously too subtle a reference to Sly Stallone for GW, hence why they were more on the nose with their next one. It also, like elsewhere in the Codex, name dropped the Harridan and Dominatrix, two large Tyranid creatures from Epic that weren't usable in this book, or indeed any Tyranid Codex proper, although the Harridan has had a model and rules from Forge World. There's also a few little lore nuggets showing the Imperium realising places are falling to gene stealer cults that are particularly fun. In retrospect, passing references to worship of the Great Mother in the Sky are particularly ominous. And although not part of anything bigger, there's also this quote that we quite like. I know you may find the Tyranids physically repellent to look at, but believe me, you don't want to let them out of your sight. So, what kind of gruesome gribblies did the army list in this book allow you to take? I'm so glad you asked. Well, as with all 2nd edition armies, it was broken down into several types. In here, it's individuals, broods, and support. And there were different requirements for how much from each type you could have. For example, at least 25% of your army needed to be from the broods type, which was your basic troops choices. For individuals, there was the Hive Tyrant, who, just like now, was a huge, heavily customizable monstrous psyker. At least one must be present in every Tyranid army, and you could include one for every 1,000 points. There were also the Galaxy Brain Zoanthropes, who didn't fly like the modern ones, having a radically different model, but made up for it by being able to nullify any attack fired against them by rolling 2d6, and if the result was higher than the strength of the attack, it did nothing. Lictors rounded off the individuals available and were just as sneaky as ever. For broods, there were Tyranid warriors, gene stealers, termagants, hormagaunts, and gargoyles, who were all more or less similar to their current incarnations, occasional bucktooth models aside. Although the gargoyles were able to fly high, and by that I mean bugger off the table only to return in a later movement phase whenever they wanted. Support choices were Carnifexes, otherwise known as Screamer Killers because they weren't two distinct entries at this point, Ripper Swarms, Spore Mines, and Biovores. Spore Mines could be purchased as their own unit and would randomly float around the table, exploding when coming into contact with a non tyranid unit, but they were also the ammo for Biovores, who would launch them up to 100 inches across the table, which for most games just means anywhere on the table. Possibly anywhere in the room. Unsurprisingly, Tyranids could not take any allies, on account of the fact they'd only eat them. The larger models could also take many different biomorph upgrades. Some will be familiar to current Tyranid players, and some are pretty simple, like Tough and Exoskeleton giving you plus one toughness, although there are a few fun ones like Optic Membranes, which were membranes that flick over the eyes to protect them from things that can blind them, like that scene in Shin Godzilla. Oh man, Shin Godzilla's great, isn't it? There was also Regenerate, which meant that a slain creature would be placed on its side, and then could later regenerate its lost wounds and come back to life. However, your opponent could still keep shooting into the corpse to add to the amount of wounds it needs to regenerate. There was also Aura of Torment. Interesting less for what it was mechanically, it was just a leadership debuff for enemies within 8 inches, but more for its description. The creature continuously projects a psychic aura of raw alien hostility which disrupts the enemy, grating at the edge of their brains, like a blunt razor blade being scraped across glass. Which is pretty flipping metal if I do say so myself. Codex Tyranids was another book that had a nice section on the weapons the faction uses, complete with lore and illustrations, some of which really showed off the obvious influence of H.R. Giger's alien designs on the whole Tyranid look. Which as a byproduct also means it kind of feels like we're going to get demonetized if we don't censor half of them. Something not helped by the descriptions featuring sentences like, Deep inside the quivering innards of the Death Spitter is a warm, wet brood chamber. Now, children, we're going to learn about something called the firing colon. <laughs> the Tyranids also required a bunch of extra little rules. Normal units in 2nd edition couldn't just fire at whatever they wanted, they had to fire at the closest unit. But they could pick between the nearest vehicle or squad. Since Tyranids don't have vehicles, their list is instead broken into three tiers. Monstrous creatures, man-sized creatures, and smaller creatures. Then there was a list of unique effects certain weapons had on them. Flamers, for example, can still set them on fire, but due to the fact they're immune to psychology, they won't panic about it. They're, ironically, kinda chill about the whole affair. But that wasn't all in the Armulus department, because this codex had a second list in it, the Gene Stealer Cult Armulus. 
It's not super big, and most of it is what you'd expect from looking at the current army. You know, patriarchs, maguses, icon bearers, hybrids, brood brothers, and regular old gene stealers. It's in their support choices that things got a little more interesting. They had Brood Brothers heavy weapons teams, Rapiers and Tarantulas, which were little gun turrets that were later reimagined by Forgeworld, as well as Mole Mortars and Thud Guns, both of which were canonically squat developed weapons that were later adopted into the Imperium proper, Mole Mortars being particularly fun since they fired a burrowing projectile into the ground, so they were like a reverse mortar. Those two were also later reimagined by Forgeworld, because of course they were. The Gene Stealer Cults also had access to more Imperial vehicles than they do now. As well as Lehman Russes, Chimeras, and Sentinels, they also got some Space Marine vehicles too, namely Rhinos, Land Raiders, and Predators. They also had access to Imperial Guard Land Speeders, which is a Rogue Trader era unit the Imperial Guard still had in early 2nd edition, but lost by the time the Imperial Guard Codex had come out. Unfortunately, this all meant that the Gene Stealer Cults didn't actually have any unique vehicles of their own, lacking even their fancy limos from 1st edition. Although you'll be pleased to hear those did make a brief comeback when a Gene Stealer Cults list was printed during 3rd edition in the Citadel Journal. A Gene Stealer Cult army could take allies from the Chaos Army list because Chaos are just down to cause a little mayhem and they don't need much of an excuse to mess with an Imperial planet. Which I suppose also ties into their old rogue trader law, where it was not uncommon for a gene stealer cult to be a chaos cult as well. Finally, let's take a look at the colour section of the book. Since 1995, the entire Tyranid model range has been overhauled, so these all look quite different to the models you may be used to. Hive Tyrants had a beautiful grin, Carnifexes were shouty, Lictors were incredibly pointy, you know, that kind of thing. Some units like Termagants and Gene Stealers are relatively close to their modern iterations, but others like Tyranid Warriors are really out there, looking all weird and gangly. They're much less unified design-wise when compared to the modern Nids, which also extends to their colour schemes, which were more linked to unit type than Hive Fleet. In fact, there's nothing to say that different Hive Fleets even had different colourations at all in this book. Still, I suppose this does lead to good readability of units. Even from across the table, I'd easily be able to tell which unit was which just by the paint job, even if I'm not wearing my glasses. Oh, there's also a rare example of some of the fiction showing up in the colour section of a codex here too. That's not important or particularly interesting, but if we noticed it, then we're going to force you to as well. And that was the second edition version of Codex Tyranids. Despite its colourful presentation and occasional inconsistency, it's surprisingly close to their modern interpretation. And also, it was a nice bonus to get the Gene Stealer Colts list in here too, even if it unfortunately does lack the limos. Now that our task is completed, we are going to go forth and consume copious amounts of biomass as a tribute. Because if it's good enough for Tyranids, it's good enough for us too. That was just a fancy way of saying you want a takeaway, isn't it? Yep.